Support for Steppin' Out comes in part from the Kristovich family in honor of Mary Lou and Bill Kristovich. I'm Peggy Scott Laborde, and welcome to Steppin' Out, spotlighting the New Orleans area's arts and entertainment scene. New Orleans is now over 300 years old. So, on this special edition of Steppin' Out, we'll actually step back and focus on some folks who contributed to our city's architecture and literary history. Seated at our table tonight, architectural historian and longtime involved with Tulane University and also local preservationist and so much more. And Mass on my pal. Okay. Good to see you. And Thank speaking you. of pals, Susan Larson, host of the <laughs> radio program, The Reading Life, airing uh, weekly on WWNO. And of course, Susan also covers the local book scene for us. Speaking of books, photographer and author <laughs> Sally Asher. And just won a Press Club Award. Congratulations. Thank you. Good to see you all. But first up, Anne. And we start with the early days. It wasn't exactly a piece of cake to live in New Orleans in 1718, <laughs> was it? Oh, no. It it was terrible. The <laughs> anvil came in 1718 and said, here is the spot right on the crescent of the river. But it was three years later, in 1721, that they actually came to lay out the city. And this was done by French military engineers. And they had quite the time. They spoke about the beginning being so terrible that the water came into the houses and caused disease and pestilence. Of course, there was not really a levee at the time, just a little natural rise where we have our levee now. So they were charged with laying out a a whole city, not just a trading post, but a city. And of course, this is one of the earliest renderings, 1726. Yes, wow. this is a wonderful picture, isn't it? I don't know that they were able to accomplish as much as you see here, but you see the little town, and on this side of the river, in what is now Algiers Point, you see them clearing the trees, cutting them down, burning the timbers and the extra materials, and lurking in the bushes are alligators. <gasps> and also deer and going down uh, the river in a canoe are some of uh, the officials and also some of the Native Americans who lived here first. Mm. But it was a terrible time. Think mm -hmm. of the, there was Rosso cane that was about 12 feet high, virgin cypress timber, lots of swampy areas as well as relatively high ground. The mosquitoes, think about the mosquitoes. <laughs> and all imagine. kinds of insects and uh. rats. They tried to order something for the new St. Louis Parish Church, a tabernacle. And they sent to France saying it should be stone because if it were of wood, the rats would eat it away mm. immediately. Well, speaking so of buildings, this was a though, challenge. Um, mm -hmm. the Ursuline like Convent's really among the older buildings in the quarter, isn't it? Yes, it is the oldest. And it's the second, we should say it's the second one because the first one pretty much fell apart. It did. Yeah. The first one yeah. uh, so this is fell the down. One. This is mm -hmm. the second Ursuline mm -hmm. Convent designed by Brutin, a French engineer, in 1745. And you'll see that it is pretty much what we see there today. Yeah. But if you go there, be sure you take a good look at the stairway because that is from the first con convent of 1734. Mm -hmm. So they saved it. It was, And it's so beautiful. Huge logs of cypress wood just hewn to make the steps. And of course available uh, for tours. And we have to back up because we can't deny Mr. Monsieur Bienville to Bienville and Sally, oh, no, not. our founder. And um, But you have done some recent research, uh, old new research here, about many layered gentlemen, wasn't oh, he? Oh, multi-layered. He, he was the ultimate Renaissance man, essentially. He was like the perfect kind of politician. Um, he was very pragmatic. He was the first who actually could speak the language without an interpreter with the Native American tribes. And the English, while they had more money and were able to trade actual goods, they trusted Bienville a lot more than they did the English. And one of those main reasons was that because he adorned them himself with multiple tattoos. And during this time we period, this. Yes, yeah. <laughs> by the way, during uh, d yeah, that's not the actual <laughs> picture of him. But during uh, during the time, you know, this was basically you were considered a social outcast. 
harassed by the French if you were tattooed. Mm -hmm. And Bienville, not only did, was he covered, they say, from basically neck to ankle, his tattoos were this nice mix of French, Christian, and Native American. And he had the Virgin Mary, he had Jesus, he had multiple flora and fauna. And what he was most famous for was he had a giant snake <laughs> that wrapped around him where, um, I believe it was Henri Tanti who wrote, uh, whose tongue pointed to a certain extremity. <laughs> and uh, which and we have said. Jonathan Bartlett to thank because he helped recreate that wonderful illustration oh, it's a from the great, it's a great illustration. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yes, uh, Monsieur de Bienville and of course his older brother Iberville, we have to give a little bit of credit to, to uh, for being some of the early explorers. But what's so interesting is that there were these accounts of early New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Sister uh, Marie Hachard. Oh, Marie Madeleine Hachard the nun who came here to found the Ursuline convent, came here when she was so young in 1727 and chronicled her life here with such grace and insight. And she did write a wonderful thing, which is the women here are extremely ignorant as to the means of securing their salvation, but they are very <laughs> expert in the means of displaying their beauty. And so we learned so much about her from so many great books like Emily Clark's Masterless Mistresses, Shannon Lee Dottie's Building the Devil's Empire, Bienville's Dilemma by Richard Campanella, and of course Larry Powell's Accidental City. So much great work on that period of time and forward. Fascinating. And of course, and we should point out though, of course, by um, uh, the late 1700s though, here is a city, a burgeoning city, but there are two disastrous fires. Mm -hmm. Yes, the fires destroyed in 1788 and 94. 1788 and 1794. Now, 1788 uh, was probably the worst, although 1794 caught another area of what is now the French Quarter, the mercantile area. So in the first fire, uh, they said about 850 houses, three quarters of the town was destroyed. And of course, you couldn't call on FEMA or the Red Cross. So people were just devastated. The women had gathered on, particularly the women, had gathered on the levee, uh, crying and tearing their hair, didn't know where to go. There was no shelter at all. So the city that had been built first by the French and then by the Spanish was almost entirely destroyed. So these were important moments in the history of the city. And of course, we have to point out from almost the beginning of the city that the, um, the injection of slaves and slave labor mm -hmm. coming in, in, in New Orleans. Many slaves, in many instances, the town was probably more African than New Orleanian at, at the top. Yes, and at certain points, there were more um, enslaved peoples than there were European settlers. So it, it probably made for a very interesting dynamic, I suppose you might say. But the uh, ships with enslaved people began arriving in the 1720s. Mm. And there were never enough. And whether you speak of soldiers or indentured servants or enslaved people or settlers, there just were not enough people to clear all of the land and build the buildings that were needed. So it took quite a while to build out the original city, which is the French Quarter. And of course, as the city expanded, we cannot forget Bernard de Marigny and the laying out of the streets. I know you've recently done a book on street names. Uh, it's sort of homage to John Chase and Frenchman Desire, good children, of course. But de Marigny could see the influx, of course, of, of, of people, especially after what, the slave riot in Haiti, in Saint-Domingue, coming to New Orleans, Creoles of color and French Creoles. Mm -hmm. And de Marigny knew he, he could develop property and people were buying. Thing. Yeah, one of the benefits to selling off, slicing off part of, your, part of your plantation was you got to name the streets. And <laughs> Bernard, it was really interesting that most of the men at that time who would name the streets primarily would name them after family members or military heroes that they admired. And Bernard Marinet discovered was the only one who would name them after vices or things that, <laughs> things that he enjoyed, um, Crap Street, which... Mm -hmm. uh, he lost a lot of money to, which is now Burgundy Street, uh, Good Children, which is now St. Claude. He also had poets, love, desire, genius, desire, desire yeah. vir you know, <laughs> virtue. Um, who wouldn't want to live on Genius Street? I mean, that, I, I would love to give that as my address. But nobody was more influential in the street naming and more creative than, than Marigny was. Mm -hmm. And he lived through French, Spanish, you know, United States.
um, he saw so many different things and was just kind of looked upon as the ultimate Creole Creole and just really interesting character. Well, we are uh, time traveling fairly quickly, but of course, uh, by 1803, um, you know, becoming American and the influx of America, and of course, the Battle of New Orleans. But there was really, and, and Marini is a good example, he was trying to keep it French, and there were people who were mm -hmm. so consumed with trying to keep it French, but it was hard because of the influx of the Americans, wasn't it? Yes, this is off the top of my head. I believe it was Nicholas Gerard who was, um, I think, maybe our second or third mayor, and he was French, and they said, well, now, that you're, you know, now that we're an American city, you need to learn to speak English. No. They should all <laughs> learn to speak French. Yes. You know, refuse to. So the, the French influence, at one point, I think there was six to eight Napoleon streets. Um, <laughs> and they had to pass, it was toward um, the beginning of the pretty much late 1890s where they made a law that you could only have one street unless it was uptown or you know mm -hmm. Canal Street the neutral ground uh -huh. which they looked as almost separate um, a lot of John the Baptist and a lot of Napoleon, mm -hmm. which he and would have course, liked. <laughs> Becoming sure. American wow. and then fast forwarding to the middle of the 19th century, the Civil War, New Orleans is taken over fairly early, so fortunately did not burn such as Atlanta did, but we had Gen uh, General Benjamin Butler, and what a beast, right? What a beast, what a beast. <laughs> What, cleaned up things, but uh, took a lot of stuff away, too. Huh? Well, he did. He apparently went into the houses in the Garden District and just commandeered whatever he wanted, sideboards or armoires or whatever. And, of course, he was really, truly hated by the people in New Orleans. But uh, those who were supporters, his northern supporters, said, oh, no, the people here in Louisiana deserved it. They were, after all, mm. uh, rebels mm. and... Um, so it, he gets lasted for two years and was gone, yes. of course. But um, and once again, fast forwarding here. But by the late 1800s, in terms of a literary um, heritage, and we had that from really day one. But we should yes, talk we about, did. of course, Lafcadio Hearn, who had such a vision and window into the regular folks here too, didn't he? I love Lafcadio Hearn. I always imagine an Andrew Lloyd Webber musical that's just Lafcadio with an exclamation <laughs> point. <laughs> you know, he comes here from Cincinnati because he left Cincinnati because they were calling it the Paris of the United States, so it was time to get out. And he, he coined that famous saying, it's better to live here in sackcloth and ashes than to own the whole state of Ohio <laughs> and I feel a special kinship for him because he was a newspaper man and was the first arguably literary editor at any of the papers and wrote such landmark wonderful little books like Gumbo Zebs, Cheetah, Lost Island and the La Cuisine Creole as well. He was also an incredibly talented artist who did these marvelous woodcuts despite his failing eyesight. But eventually, after 10 years, he decided it was time to move on. Yes. And but so you know, we lost him. We, absolutely. But we can't forget the, um, the 1884 World's Fair because he was right. part of many people were doing this. I mean, guidebooks to the yes. fair, the first cultural tourism, if yes. you will. It's a big <laughs> We've deal. got to have a fair. People, have, especially this, of course, is after the war, and New Orleans is trying to reconstruct its economy, you know. And, and that was a great event the, because park, so many Audubon. writers came to New Orleans and wrote about the city and took the news to other parts of the country. I mean, that was sort of um, a motivating thing for Grace King, you know. The, the certain Creoles were very upset about George Washington Cable's portrayal of Creole life in the Grandissimes, and one of the great editors of New York magazines came to town and said to Grace King, if Cable is so false to you, why do you not do better? And she became a writer and did, you know, her mm -hmm. version of New Orleans in so many ways. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, as we, we go pretty rapidly here, but, you know, the turn of the 19th century, um, of course, uh, the pre-jazz, we're hearing ragtime. And, um, and eventually Storyville, the turn of the 20th century, the latter part, and the rise of a legalized red light districts. There were other red light districts in other cities, but this perhaps was the most notorious one, wasn't it? Yes, uh, Scarlet Squares, 16 Scarlet Squares is what they, is what they called really? it. And oh, there, I love that term. I think there, uh -huh. there was actually, um, what most people don't know, there was an ordinance in play in 1892 that passed city council that called for a regulated uh, red light district. District. And it was done by Dr. William Heron. And it had pretty much laid out exactly as Storyville was, but women had to get checked uh, prostitutes once a week for $1.50. Mm -hmm. 
and they had to get checked through the doctor. And if they didn't pass their check, they were hospitalized uh, for free, though, until they were cured. And they did an estimate, and it passed city council. And the only reason it didn't become into law is because people thought that he would have, the doctor would have a monopoly on it because he agreed to build a hospital for New Orleans at about twenty to thirty thousand dollars but the cost would be after ten years he would make well over a million dollars in you know eighteen ninety terms for that and so all these society women and prostitutes which they said was one of the first times that soil doves and society women came together met at the Roosevelt Hotel to have a, a protest and a lecture and the prostitute sat quietly in the back and the mayor vetoed it and so when Storyville came up with his ordinance five years later that passed in 1897 they took out the medical exams and and the hospital but they wanted to have a separate school strictly for treating venereal diseases mm -hmm. in New Orleans and the prostitutes would be treated for free but they would not be able to leave until they mm -hmm. were cured and so we almost had a Heronville, I guess you could. Or, uh, <laughs> Heron was uh, a Heron, a Heronville, <laughs> yes. Well, at that point, of course, we already had a strong musical legacy. We've got the French Opera House going. Uh, a lot of the, um, of the players in their orchestra would ultimately become the teachers of the early jazz musicians, of course. And then you've got the legacy of Edmond Dede and the, and the Creole of color composers. And we can't forget Gottschalk, who spread the mm -hmm. music all over the world as well. So you've got that going. You've got ragtime, we've got gospel, European influence, and of course African influence, and that's what we start to hear. Little Louis Armstrong, who's delivering coal mm -hmm. to the houses in Storyville, is hearing the early days of jazz, isn't he? It was amazing, and a whole cabaret scene in the Tango Belt popped up as a result Which of was right Storyville. Near Storyville. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was just, it was kind of like an, an after effect of it, where if you wanted to, I guess a lady wanted to slum, uh, which many women did, um, they, uh, they could go to the cabaret sections and listen to music. And one of the fights over music where when they tried to shut down the Tango Belt was to take away their music uh, license. And the owners over liquor would say, we can't operate without music. You know, it's, it's vital. That's what brings people in, as well as the dance halls. Um, the dance hall girls, there was uh, the table girls, the prostitutes, and the dance hall girls. And the dance hall girls were considered the lowest of the lows. The prostitutes mm -hmm. wouldn't even wouldn't even mingle with them. There was a very strict caste system. So the women who, who danced for a few cents a song uh, were considered at the bottom of the, mm. of the well, underworld yeah. Yeah. ladder. <laughs> Which just blocks away, of course. The quarter at this point is really, the slums are considered mm -hmm. the slums deteriorating, isn't it? Well, it is. It partly had to do with the old buildings were not holding up well, but it also had to do with all of the Americans who began coming after the Louisiana Purchase, but they had really achieved more economic success and different parts of the city were growing and the French Quarter came to be populated by Sicilian immigrants beginning about in the 1890s and going forward. And many of these people, of course, made great success of, them, of themselves over generations. But there was a point at which it was considered such a slum that the assessor, Maubrier, said it's not worth a darn in the French Quarter. The best thing that could happen would be another big fire. Mm. And this, of course, what a horrifying thought. But in fact, it was a fire, the burning of the French Opera House, that really spurred on the preservation movement. Mm -hmm. There had been in some interest and efforts and so forth before that. But in 1919, it burned to the ground and people were truly devastated. And the first really important preservation group came together with the hope of rebuilding, but they were not able to do that. And But they moved on, and in the 20s, we see the beginning of the historic preservation movement, mostly with Elizabeth Warline and the establishment mm -hmm. of the Vieux Carre Commission, which didn't come into its present form until the late um, 30s, but it began in the 20s. And uh, it was artists, um, uptowners, uh, uptown women who liked history and beautiful buildings. All sorts of people came and together. And writers too. And so writers. So many writers. Yes, I should have mentioned that. So <laughs> many writers. My treasure. The I mean, last frontier of Bohemia. Look, double, you've got a show double, and tell. Oh, oh. I learned this so much from 1921. 
with a piece by Love Cardio Hearn in it. But, <sighs> but yes, if, I think if I could live in any other time in New Orleans history, that would be it, because so many writers were here. And they started the Double Dealer, three friends started it as a response to H.L. Mencken calling the South the Sahara of the Beaux Arts. I love the way people <laughs> get mad and respond in <laughs> writing, you know, which I love. But of course, published Faulkner and Hemingway, and the quarter was alive with people living and working there and coming well, together. Bradford, the list is long. Yes, and so many mm -hmm. prize-winning writers at that time. But it was truly really, interesting. Yeah, yeah, such an inspiration. And of course, uh, who was attracted by the late '30s? But a certain gentleman named Tom Williams at that time. Yes, yes, Tennessee came and put his mark on the city forever. Isn't that amazing to think how it's just <laughs> lasted for so long? It kind of, it kind of is. And and you know, back to the whole idea of preservation. And I guess the, Mr. and Mrs. Kemper, General and Mrs. Kemper Williams, uh, who of course ultimately mm -hmm. started the Historic New Orleans Collection, they are among those wealthy people who say, no, 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 these buildings are important. And I understand they would have dinner parties to get I their did. friends from uptown to uh, come to the court to see how beautiful this was. Well, that's true. I think that was most of, that began in the '40s. I believe they were entertaining people mm -hmm. that. Way. But there were also people coming from outside. Mary Morrison, Mary and Jacob Morrison are a good example. They moved into what was a slummy area and devoted themselves to seeing that things were changed and the buildings were renovated and more neighbors came to live. Not so many abandoned buildings uh, by the 40s, but yet derelict buildings. But the first building that anyone tried to save was the Beauregard Kai's house, oh. which is very interesting because we're still trying to save it today. <laughs> and Francis <laughs> Parkinson and Kai. Yes, Francis course, Parkinson and Kai is certainly uh -huh. uh, General Beauregard. Yes. Uh -huh. And General Beauregard. But, um, and it was General Beauregard uh, his memory that really caused the house to be saved. I would say today we're more interested in the building and the mm -hmm. architecture and the historic site. But at the time, it was this hero worship that was sweeping across America, really, I think, of the saving of all the uh, important houses, whether it's James Madison or Thomas Jefferson. Mm -hmm. So it was part of that movement. But Francis Parkinson Kyes was the best selling author in America in, in 1948 yeah. for Dinner at Antoine's. Yes, she, she wrote 50 some right books. Here. Yes, prolific. Yeah. I mean. And she really was a, a most extraordinary person in the people that she knew and mm -hmm. entertained. And uh, whether it was Mary Pickford or um, Eleanor Roosevelt, she just had this wide acquaintance of people. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. And to yeah. this day, though, of course, the literary heritage is alive and booming and continues in the quarter. But oh, Susan, how many years were you at the Picayune covering the book team? <laughs> I mean, in the most more recent past, uh, uh, the, the literary scene in New Orleans is so blossomed. Of course, I'm going to say we've, we've got to credit the Tennessee and Williams Festival, which for we are involved in. Yeah, for th yeah. more than 30 years. But then, uh, to be a writer still in New Orleans is still a big deal, isn't it? Well, so so many writers came along and made such an impact. Tennessee Williams, of course. Shirley Ann Grau, the first mm, woman yes. to win a Pulitzer Prize from Louisiana, was a native. Started writing when she didn't get to go to grad school at Tulane. Got yeah. mad, wrote a book. I mean, <laughs> good for her. I know. <laughs> I just, <laughs> and then, of course, Walker Percy and the moviegoer kind of fixed the existential search as a part of New Orleans legend and won the National Book Award in 1961. And then John Kennedy Toole and Confederacy of Dunces, which is inextricably tied to Walker Percy and gave us one of the great legends of contemporary literature of, of writerly despair and and lack of appreciation and a great literary mother to boot and then <laughs> of course Anne Rice Anne Rice, Anne Rice in 1976 gave Undeniable. us all this overlay of the supernatural made Halloween a destination <laughs> yes, that's yes, thing that's for true. us which we owe her for that <laughs> and then Ellen Gilchrist Valerie Martin so many others Robert Olin Butler who gave us the Vietnamese culture of New Orleans in his Pulitzer Prize winner a good scent from a strange hey, Richard Mountain. Ford Richard, Richard Ford, Ford. yeah the list is long we know that isn't it but the other thing going along with that was at the same time we were we were finding all these writers who had grown up here and became national figures people like Walter Isaacson Michael Lewis, mm -hmm. Nicholas Lemon, Cokie Roberts, all of them who may not have been in New Orleans but were speaking for New Orleans, which would 
of course, be important later yeah. on. And as we, it's hard to believe we're summing up here, but uh, the whole idea, of course, Katrina. We're now many years away from Katrina, and is the city a better place? That's a rough question. <laughs> Whoa. Well, certainly, let me just start with preservation as I, I look at you. I think that, f especially since that incredible scare and, and, of course, so many horrible things, that people savor our buildings more. I, I know that I'm mm -hmm. sure there are exceptions to that, but don't you get that feeling in well, the Preservation I, Resource Center and other groups, too, VC Pura, our Vicare owners? And well, I, I think losing so much meaning of the architectural stock. So many of our neighborhoods mm -hmm. full of little shotgun cottages and bungalows and outside the quarter or the garden district, but the houses in which everybody lived. Mm -hmm. We lost so much of that that it's, it, it really makes what is left even more precious. Yes. And mm -hmm. I, I would hope that the new people coming into town really love the old buildings and don't just see them as a background for other things, be that music or food or whatever, because the buildings are, to me, the absolute core of, of the city. Without the buildings, we'd just be, uh, I don't know, another drinking town? Yeah. Another, we whatever. need to be vigilant. Yeah. So we, we need to be we vigilant to be and we need to bring um, these newcomers to our city along in appreciating mm -hmm. the history, the architecture, the literature, so that they really know the legacy that they're inheriting and living amongst, really. Mm -hmm. And Sally, your favorite street, having done a book about streets, oh, what gosh. is the quintessential <laughs> New Orleans street? Chopatulas. Really? really? Yeah. I and I it's just it's such an unusual it's such a, I mean, there's famous there's more famous streets, obviously, Bourbon Street and St. Charles Street. But mm -hmm. as for um you know, unusual names that Bourbon Street and St. Charles don't really have a, <laughs> no, a, a no. strong tie here. But Chapatulas <laughs> does and it's so it's so unique. And um during the big red scare there was um in the nineteen fifties there was a joke that they should move Wall Street to Chapatula Street because the commies wouldn't be able to say it, <laughs> and um, that Wall Street was far was far too easy and could be easily taken over. But you could never mm -hmm. take over Chapatula Street, and that's where our, should, our financial district should be. <laughs> Odd <laughs> argument. Interesting idea. Yeah. And yeah. as we conclude, though, always room for more writers and more inspiration from New Orleans. They right, Susan? Just keep on coming. It never stops. I'm so excited. I'm as excited about the books now as I was 25 years ago. Well, bravo to you all, because I know you all are very involved with so many things and keeping New Orleans stronger and better. Thank you very much. It's been a quick half hour. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Good night. <laughs>